So I was not going to watch the coronation yesterday, and then I woke up without my alarm at about 5.15, and I thought, well, what the heck? So I turned it on, got completely sucked in, and watched the entire thing. <laughs> I'm a uh, you know church nerd, so of course, all of the service I found fascinating. Every little bit of history and tradition, it was fascinating to see the contrast between the very traditional elements of that service and the whole day, and then some modern innovations. There were women bishops part of that service for the very first time. There have only been women bishops in England since 2016, so that was an innovation. There was a woman holding what looked like Excalibur to me, the royal sword. Apparently that was a first. There were people of color in the service. It was both an ancient and a modern celebration of the British monarchy. Now, coronations are designed for one purpose, to establish the legitimacy of the new king or queen. And so all this hoopla is designed to prop up this idea that this is the rightful king. I think Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, said rightful king about five times during the service. Everyone knows, okay, this is the rightful king. And all of the symbolism also kind of supports the idea of tradition and permanence, right? It's, it's the glory of the British Empire. You saw that in the military parade. I've never seen a more perfect military parade. The planning that went into that, I cannot imagine. All of those soldiers and airmen and sailors marching perfectly in step, making the corners. They had it all set up so that there was something, uh, the leaders of each group had a microphone, a microphone in their ear so they could all start exactly on the same spot. It was an incredible, amazing statement of, of British. I mean, if you're an Anglophile at all, you just couldn't help but love that day. But there were some contrasts. Some of the history was really interesting and quirky. The, um, the uh, anointing was fascinating when they put that little screen around Charles and they, I mean, you know, he had, probably took a long time getting dressed that morning and he had to get undressed in the church so that he could be anointed. One of the neat things about the oil of anointing I saw a bishop there that I thought I recognized, Bishop Hosan of the Anglican Diocese of Jerusalem. Some of us who were at, in the pilgrimage a few years ago got to meet Bishop Hosan at St. George's Cathedral in Jerusalem. He was commissioned by the royal uh, planners and the Archbishop of Canterbury to create the anointing oil basically olive oil, but there's different aromatics that are put into it. And then that oil was blessed in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. And then Bishop Hosan brought it to Westminster Abbey, gave it to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who then anointed the king with it. I kind of like that stuff. That, that really made it deeply meaningful for me to see that connection from Jerusalem. The ancient roots of the anointing of a king go all the way back to not just the British Empire, not just the origins of the British monarchy in the early Middle Ages, but all the way back to the Old Testament, right? We think of King Saul being anointed by Nathan the prophet, King David being anointed, King Solomon being anointed. And of course, the choir sang Handel's magnificent piece, Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king. So that tradition was really powerful and moving to me to see that there. And it showed me this kind of contrast that I was feeling during the whole event. The contrast between earthly power and glory, exemplified in the monarchy and all of the soldiers and the, all the pomp and circumstance, the amazing vestments that the uh, king wore. After his anointing, he was dressed as a priest. Did you notice that? They put on a cassock, this gold uh, super tunic, and they put on a stole, a priestly stole, because of course he is the head of the Church of England. Not really the Archbishop of Canterbury, but the king is the supreme governor of the Church of England. And so he was kind of vested in that sacerdotal priestly way. But the contrast between earthly glory and then these other kind of underneath it all, a deeper significance that spoke to me greatly. Perhaps for me, one of the most moving parts 
was during the gospel reading. I don't know if you noticed the book that was brought out on a little wooden platter during the gospel reading, right? We have our, our special gospel book here, but I gotta tell you, this book has nothing on the one that they used at the coronation. That is the oldest existing book in Britain. It was brought to Britain by St. Augustine of Canterbury, who brought Christianity to England in the sixth century from Rome. It is a book of gospels. And so King Charles wanted the gospel reading to be including that. Now she didn't, the bishop who read the gospel didn't use that gospel because it's written in Latin in sixth century writing. So she actually read a translation. But to have that connection, that deep connection to that history was really significant to me. And then a new Bible was given to King Charles by the moderator of the Church of Scotland. And I don't know if you caught the language, but it cracked me up because in true Scottish fashion, the moderator in giving this very ceremonial Bible, newly bound for the new king, kind of put King Charles in his place. You could almost, like a paraphrase of what he said is, don't get too big for your britches, laddie. <laughs> you, you may be the king, but you serve the king of kings. That was kind of the gist of that presentation. And that really struck me because that was also the theme of the Archbishop of Canterbury's sermon that the king's job is not to bask in the glory and honor and pomp of his position, but to be a servant for his people and a servant of God. That was one of the themes that spoke to me greatly. And I see that same tension and that same theme in our scriptures today. The contrast between what we see around us in this earthly reality and the deeper spiritual reality that we have to struggle sometimes to see and to hold on to. Think of St. Stephen, the first martyr of the church, who was so powerfully moved by his relationship with Jesus Christ that he preached about Jesus even to a hostile crowd who turned on him and stoned him to death because of his words. Stephen, whose life was passing away, right? All the earthly stuff was going away, and yet he was able to have a vision of Christ standing at the right hand of God and to quote the words of Jesus on the cross. Do not hold this sin against them, he prayed, and into your hands I commend my spirit. Stephen, who was able to identify so closely with his Savior Jesus, that he could see the spiritual reality even in the midst of a terrible earthly catastrophe. You see that in the gospel today. This past Monday was St. Philip's Day, our patron saint. It's also the 30th anniversary of the dedication of this building. This edition was on St. Philip's Day in 1993, so it's 30 years. And I love that the gospel that's used for St. Philip's Day is this gospel, and it's Philip as a complete idiot. <laughs> I love that. Philip, who is demanding of Jesus, show us the Father, right? It's time, you've been talking to us, talking to us over and over, but you never show us the Father. And Jesus says to him in loving words, Philip, you idiot. <laughs> I'm right here. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Yeah, I look like a regular guy. I'm wearing sandals, they're kind of dusty. I got this toga or whatever they were wearing on. You need to look closer, look deeper, see the spiritual reality that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I am a physical manifestation of God. Don't you get that by now? Have you been with me all this time, three years? You're still not getting it, right? Shows how hard it is to look beyond the things of this world to see the deeper spiritual truth. And then, of course, in Peter's epistle, we have the beautiful image that the church is not a building. It is people. The stones that were laid to make this building are not what make St. Philip's 
real. It is you. You are the spiritual stones that have been laid upon the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Someday, this is a spoiler alert, someday this church ain't gonna be here. I was looking at the power and permanence of Westminster Abbey. That church isn't gonna last forever either. It's gonna last a long time. It's gonna be hard to knock it down. But think about that St. Augustine Gospel book from the sixth century. Think of all the churches in England that still exist from the sixth century. David, how many are still standing from the sixth century? Zero, not one. But the word of God endures forever. Passed on by the living stones that have carried that gospel forward for 1400 years and beyond. I've had personal painful experience of the transitoriness of life. You all have too. The cathedral, beautiful Gothic cathedral that I was confirmed in, in Los Angeles, was damaged by earthquakes and is now a parking lot. There is no longer a St. Paul's Cathedral in Los Angeles. The parish that I first served as a vicar in Western New York, a vibrant church of hardworking, wonderful people, closed about uh, five, well, eight or nine years ago after a series of problems that they had. I won't go into all the gory details, but that church we thought we were building for forever and it's no longer there. When I go back to the Buffalo area and drive past there on Route 5, where's John? Route 5 in, in uh, Hamburg, <laughs> uh, it hurts my heart to know that that church is not there. But the legacy is, legacy is, the faith of those people was not in vain because the true church was not built out of bricks and mortar, but built out of the faith and lives of the people of God. We are stewards of that legacy. That's what came to me in that service yesterday as I was watching the coronation. Stewards of a legacy that stretches from the beginning of time until all of creation is brought to its conclusion in God's final uh, and ultimate realization of the reign of God. I pray that we might have that vision, the vision of St. Stephen. Ultimately, after a little remedial work, the vision of St. Philip, the vision of those saints throughout the ages, like St. Augustine of Canterbury, those who have passed on their faith to us, entrusted it to us so that we can nourish it and pass it on to the next generation. May we, amidst lives that are full of crisis, problems, and challenges, when we feel like everything is falling apart, and it is, but it's okay, because our foundation is not in any of the things of this world, but in Christ. That's why we sang our opening hymn, a hymn whose name is Westminster Abbey, named for that beautiful church in the coronation, and whose first line I hope you will bring with you as you leave church today. Christ is made the sure foundation. Christ, the head and cornerstone. We are the living stones fashioned by God in love to rest upon that sure foundation and to become a spiritual temple that will last forever.